I'm Titus Murray. I'm a structural geologist working on fault seal issues based out of Sydney in Australia. Today we're going to be having a look at the Niger Delta. So to give you an idea where we're going to get to, um, we had a look at a number of great examples of the Niger Delta. Uh, we went and compared those using the methodologies that Shell's written about. And what we found is that if we use good juxtaposition analysis, we can have a pretty good understanding and explanation of fluid contacts. It turns out that Shell's original papers that, that Alan wrote um, and worked on from the 60s, 70s and 80s really do work. So when I'm talking about fault seal, I'm thinking about seal over charge and accumulation time. So geological time scales. The thing we're going to be looking at is, well, does SGR work? Is it a useful membrane seal algorithm? Or are there other explanations for how faults work? Well, in the background here, I'm in Miri in Sarawak, which is actually close to Shell's offices in Luton. And we're standing in the footwell of a fault. This is the strike of the fault. This is the downthrown side. And we're standing in the upthrown side. You can see here we've got lots of good fault rock. Um, now, if we have a look in detail though, things change. So just near my glasses, you can see that we've actually got no fault rock at all. And in fact, we've got some of this is actually sand gouge. Sylvia De Rosa did a really good um, paper. But fundamentally, what we find is that faults change thickness. What this really means is that for fluid contract controls, it's a combination of the fault displacement and the stratigraphic seal thickness, not the fault rock thickness. We have to recognize that there is fundamental uncertainty and complexity. So it's vital to use stochastic modeling. So if we have a look at the history of fault seal analysis and what Shell have done with fault seal analysis, you know, the, the single most important paper in, t in terms of this canon is that of Urban Allen's work. And really what he says is the fault is neither a seal or a conduit. The faulting affects the migration and entrapment depend on the stratal juxtaposition of reservoirs and seals. That's the key bit to it. But fundamentally what we're looking at is we're looking at the length of the fault. We're looking in the plane of the section on the fault plane profile. We have a reservoir, two reservoirs in the foot wall, the A foot wall reservoir and the B foot wall reservoir. We then have a look at where the hang wall is, so on this side of the, of the diagram. And we can then trace over the top of those where the A is in the hang wall and where the B is in the hang wall. So these diagrams are a little bit complicated, but they really give us a lot of utility. If we just do a cross section, you can see near the maximum displacement, my B reservoir in the foot wall is juxtaposed against top seal. Hmm. Okay, yeah, fine. We've got some potential for an accumulation using Allen's methodology. But if we go and have a do a cross section through this area and here, we can see that B and A actually juxtapose. So really what we're looking for is these areas of juxtaposition and what's the highest point of juxtaposition in there because that's what's going to control the fluid contact. Alan produced these beautiful diagrams um, by hand and I still reckon that there's a lot to be done in this and they should give you a good idea about the spill fill chain of how the accumulation. Um, so effectively hydrocarbons move up they can fill this accumulation here, it backfills until it gets to X, it then leaks. That then fills up this compartment here from the crest, it fills, fills, fills until it gets to, to Y, and at Y it starts to fill across. Now, Y can keep filling from this point down, down, down. As it does that, it backfills into this compartment. It keeps filling until it gets to Z, and then it spills back up across to this accumulation which then effectively spills out through there. So this spill fill chain is a way of hydrocarbons moving vertically up the faults but not actually moving up the fault strictly but like a spiral staircase winding its way up through the system. Now the diagrams are a little bit complicated but once you get your head around them they're really really useful. So you know old shell had a pretty good method and it worked well. So then we get a new shell. New shell's brighter, shinier, computers, you know, things have changed. We've moved on. And this second paper comes out. So Alan's paper came out in July 1989 and the second Shell paper came out in November 89. So really close together, but a very big difference in, in methodology and, um, and philosophy. The Nun River paper 
which is Niger Delta, and that's why it's pertinent for us to think about for, for, for the Nigerian examples, is based on their first three-dimensional rotation tools. In the paper, they give you an idea about the football geometry of the fault we're going to have a look at. But my question is, is this actually an Allen map? Because when they go through the methodology, what they say in here is effectively they pick a fault plane and they go at 75 metres out into the hang wall and they do an interpretation out 75 metres from the fault. And then they do another interpretation 75 metres into the foot wall. So effectively, they're doing interpretations that are 150 metres apart and then slamming them together um, to provide a um, Allen map. Maybe it doesn't work. Anyway, so I thought I'd go back and, tr and see if I could replicate the work. The first thing I found when I went to replicate the work is that based on using SP logs. Spontaneous potential logs measure sand. They don't measure shale. We've moved on a lot and in large extent the gamma ray logs are the things we should be using because they tell us where the shales are. The SP log will overrepresent the sand thickness. So if we're starting to think about membrane seal and we're starting to think about new methodologies, maybe we should be using the right log. Well, the Allen map was pretty complicated, as you can see. So I thought I'd start out by going and taking their foot wall diagram here and working out which bits of the foot wall appeared on the hanging wall. Did this in Lithotech, but I've shown you here in PowerPoint because anyone can go through and replicate this assertion. When I go through and stick the foot wall diagram onto their full Allen map, we've got major busts. These busts these variations in here, that should be in here. This should actually be up in here. These variations up in here are of the order of the accumulation size. It makes this really, really hard to actually to reconcile. So I'm immediately at a point where I can't replicate the work. I don't think it's an L map. They've used SP logs and it doesn't hang together. Hmm. Yet this is the paper where we start to use membrane seal. Where are we here? Because, yeah. You know, Here's Donald Rumsfeld, who was Secretary of State for Defence for George W. Um, and he was making the claim of weapons of mass destruction. And he ha had some really interesting philosophy, and this came out, you know, out of the blue. Yeah, he talked about the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. Well, where do we think we are in terms of this paper, in terms of juxtaposition analysis and, and using a membrane seal? I'd sit there and say, well... We probably know we're in the unknowns area. We actually don't have good enough picture to work out what's going on here. Now, this is super important because the this work keeps being used in other papers, and in particular, it forms the basis of this quantitative fault seal prediction paper. Uh, if you might recognise, this is the Nun River example reproduced uh, again in another piece of software. When we don't go and do the comparison between the original paper, the Bouvier paper and this paper, you can see we have similar big busts, but not the same big busts. There's a real problem with one of the fundamental examples for using shell gouge ratio. Now, Bill Power and I have had a look at one of the other examples in the quantitative fault seal um, paper, and we are coming around to the Osseberg field not being controlled by shale gouge ratio and juxtaposition analysis. Fundamentally, it's controlled by uh, lateral facet change. It's a strat trap. So where do we stand on SGR? Are we a bit like Donald? Are we prosecuting a case on a poor data set? You might sit there and say, well, hey, Titus, it's common knowledge. We've all seen fault seals. Now, there was a field I worked on, but I can't provide the data. Or we, we pumped the well and the production dropped and as the production dropped, we got the fault broke through, we got breakthrough and we had increased production. Well, all of these are classic straw man cases. What we're doing with a straw man is we're putting forward an argument that conflates another argument. We said, yes, fault seal exists in production. But I start out saying, hey, I'm talking about fault seal over those longer charge and accumulation time scales, the thousands of years, not the 10, 20, 30, 40 days of um, production as oil water contact moves across the fault. So be careful of this conflation and the use of a, of a straw man argument. 
We actually need to replicate cases and understand them from a sensible methodology. This is another really good paper I can highly recommend. Um, it's from the team at ExxonMobil um, from 2004. And you can see when you have a look at this, this diagram actually looks pretty much like Allen's diagram. That's because they use his methodology. And what they've done in this paper is they have taken Allen maps, they've gone and looked at where they have these crossover points or these potential leap points, and then done Monte Carlo simulations to look at the range of different columns that could be trapped in the system. So they're not using SGR, they're not using a membrane seal. They're simply saying we've got uncertainty on the stacking of our reservoir seal pairs, and we're going to look at that uncertainty. Again, one of the things I really like about the guys at Exxon, what they've done is they've actually published when things do and don't work. And they tell you where the multi-fault analysis, um, their stochastic methodology, is successful and failed. Yeah, we With COVID, we've all got used to um, lateral flow tests or antigen tests having false negatives and false positives. It's important to understand where things do and don't work. So what I've been trying to do is look at other methodologies. And again, there are other YouTubes out there that go in more detail about um, how we've ap approached stochastic fault seal analysis and the comparison of SGR and Drake's position. The paper's out there for you to have a look at, but I'll just give you a very quick background so that you've got co context for the rest of the talk. Fundamentally, we do a Monte Carlo simulation and for each fault block, we have multiple faults. We Monte to color the spill point, the crest, and the fault geometry. And we have a stack of stratigraphy. And from those, we get juxtaposition diagrams and look at where we've got potential fluid contacts. We also, at the same time, do an SGR calculation. So for that, we have V-shale and the uh, hydrocarbon density, and they're used to calculate the across fault pressure difference and potential hydrocarbon fluid contacts. So for each fault block, um, we look at at realization one is it fault A, is it fault B, or is it filled to spill? And for each realization, that gets us uh, a weakest leak point, and that gets us distributions of hydrocarbon water contacts. Also, for each realization, we go and compare the modeled hydrocarbon water contact with the observed hydrocarbon water contact in hind casting. What we're doing then is we're taking a known known and we're using it to better understand how these act algorithms work and that comparison is really useful so here's a quick summary again it's in the paper but fundamentally what we have is error for juxtaposition and error for juxtaposition plus SGR and what you see is that the SGR error is always larger than the juxtaposition error so to the Niger Delta this is a really nice image. It gives you an idea about what the delta looks like just now. We've got a set of channels that are moving out radially. Even though there's complexity, we actually have a sensible story. So we're going to have a look at OML226. Um, in this was the NOAA discovery. So to do a fault seal analysis, we need a good depth structure contour map, which shows where the faults are. Um, with contours, we can read. And this one's really good in that we have a simple scenario with a great big fat sand. So we don't have complexities in the stratigraphic template. So it allows us to make some really interesting inferences. So the first thing I do is I go and count contours. Now you might sit there and say, well, I'm just being a train spotter. I've got my anorak on and I'm doing something boring. Well, I find this a really useful technique and I'm sure this is what Alan was doing in his initial work. In here, what we've got side of the fault is my black line here. And then on the northern side over here is the gray line. Now, what I can see immediately from this is we've got changes in throw. When we go through and annotate this then, um, what we can see is that in my throw profile, if I draw a zero line in here, I've got a number of places where I have no throw. And that's in here and here. And what that's saying to me is it, for this section in here, it dips to the north and for this section in here it dips to the south and this section in he in here dipping to the north again so we've got these systems that are flip-flopping does add a level of complexity the other thing by going and checking out the contours we can see that for this fault here there is no throw on it so effectively this fault is invisible anything on on the western side 
can move across to the eastern side. And that's important because our fluid contact is in here. Now the fluid contact matches really nice with this zero throw element in here. That accumulation in there is controlled by this leak point in here. The interesting thing is as you come across this side of the fault in here, you can see this, this leak point is actually shallower than the accumulation. So it forces us to really sit there and think about this and is it like the, the image behind me and effectively I've got a set of channels. And I, my temptation is to sit there and say, well, this is actually a channel sand and it, it terminates before it gets to the red point in here. So somewhere in here is where my channel um, has to stop. Now you can see what I've done here is we've used displacement profile analysis, but we've also used our understanding of the geology to sit there and explain the fluid accumulations. We're not saying, hey, I've got a ceiling fault in here um, and inventing a strange algorithm. I'm using a, a stratigraphic template. And it's important to understand when fault seal does and doesn't work. So the second case study we've got is um, the Yoko field. Um, Shell have published a set of nice SPE papers on the field. Um, in this paper, they go through four different methodologies for trying to reduce uncertainty on the observed hydrocarbon water contacts. Um, they use their proprietary tools, they use some reservoir simulation ideas, and they use quantitative interpretation and a 3D modeling approach. Great piece of work in that we've got a contour map that we can read and we can count the contours. Fantastic. And we can work out what the contours are on either side of this. Unfortunately, missing contours out here and out across the hanging wall. Um, but we know we've got an accumulation and we know where the wells are, so we've got something there. They've also given us a cross section, which is fantastic, and a stratigraphic template. And they're shown here the observed hydrocarbon water contacts. So what we've done is we've taken this and run it through fault risk to see how we go. Now, for the X1000, the top sand, we end up with this being filled to spill. And so I put some uncertainty on my spill point and I get myself, you know, a seven or eight meter error. But fundamentally, this thing is, is, is not controlled by SGR. It's controlled by spill point. That's the key bit to it. Now, we'll go to the X2000 sand and we've got a 93% chance of getting an 18 meter column. Hmm. Okay, well, it's a fair bit, but when you have a fair bit of error, but when you have a look at the, the error distribution in here, this actually looks as though it's a set of three distributions. If we had more data, uh, and we had better maps, we'd be going through and breaking these distributions out and trying to work out what these scenarios are. And I think this is probably a separate accumulation, in, a separate um, model in here, and we'd go and have a look at that. Now, if we go to the X3000, well, we've actually got a really good result here. We've got a 21 meter error, so it's a large error, but again, we've got this, bi this bimodal uh, distribution of error. And if we're using, if we start having a look at this part of it, I'd sit and say we've got maybe a 50, 60% chance of getting ourselves a 10 meter error. Now, to get something right once on one sand, well, actually, it's three sands, Hmm, yeah, we're actually doing pretty well here. And these errors match to the sorts of errors that we see uh, in our published cases. So this is in our paper. And our P50 cases, we're seeing errors in the order of 10 to 15 meters. We expect these sorts of errors using juxtaposition analysis and you know not having perfect data sets. Um, these are pretty good answers. So coming back to Donald, you know, why are we doing it? You know, why were you running with SGR? Is it because we're using heuristics? And heuristics are quick thinking tools. I highly recommend going and having a look at some of Claire Bond's work where she looks at cognitive bias in structural geology. And I'd sit there and say, I think we've got a cognitive bias. So to use an example of cognitive bias, I'm a geologist, I have a hammer. I love my hammer. I can fix everything with my hammer. My office is full, full of IKEA furniture. I don't put it together on the hammer, do I? I put IKEA furniture together with an Allen key. That's the appropriate tool. I could use a hammer, but I'd do a really lousy job. It might be quicker. It wouldn't last very well. Just wouldn't work. So are we jumping on SGR as a quick and easy tool? 
we can make these triangle plots really simply. We go and get a log from a nearby well, we go and generate the triangle plot, and we sit there and say, oh yeah, I've got myself this amount of throw, yeah, I think I'll be okay. Is this just lazy thinking? I'd argue that we should be using Allen, you know, the original 1960s, 70s thinking, and building these Allen maps. They take a little bit more work, but they're a much more elegant solution. You get something that stands up and it stays up for a reasonable amount of time. So, in conclusion, if juxtaposition works well, and we've shown it works well, and the Exxon papers are showing it works well, why are we using SGR? Everyone would be really happy to say, well, look, doing good mapping and good sequence stratigraphy are the things that we should be doing. And if you use those, getting a decent displacement field and understanding your stratigraphic seal thicknesses are the obvious things to do. And can you explain the accumulation using that? Remember, faults do have uncertainty and complexity. And we've been a strong proponent of using stochastic modeling techniques. Um, and I'd highly recommend it. We found it works really, really well. We can get really good results using stochastic modeling, using effectively the old fashioned shell techniques. You know, these Allen maps, and it's worth having a look at this paper, mixed together with a Monte Carlo simulator, do a fantastic job of, of describing fluid contacts. Now, we've got two cases here. One is a stratigraphic trap and we're showing, and the second one we're using the Monte Carlo simulation techniques. Over the coming year, we've got a whole set of these examples and we'll go through. I've set myself a fairly tough target. I'm hoping through this year we'll be able to get one of these out a month so we can illustrate that there is good data out there, there is the capacity to replicate ideas, and we can learn from the older methods with new computing. Hope you've enjoyed this. If you've got any questions or you've got more case studies, please let us know. Put notes in there or send it through to us. We'd love to hear what case studies you can think of that might be around the world. I look forward to seeing you soon.